Hello, my name is Colin Doyle, and I'm a senior systems engineer with Juniper Networks. A few days ago, I was on the phone with a customer, and we were discussing an SD-WAN POC, and specifically, our options for pairing an SRX cluster in their data center with two downstream routers. Now, before I get into the problem statement, it's important to understand how Juniper's CSO SD-WAN solution provisions these downstream connections in the data center. Whether static or dynamic using OSPF or BGP, and whether or not you define a single connection or multiple connections, two configuration elements are constant. First, each connection, even if you only have one, requires user-defined VLAN ID. Second, all connections will be added to a single logical redundant Ethernet interface, or RETH. In this case, this interface is RETH4, and you can see that expressed here on the screen. RETH4 will be a trunk, and it will be configured for LACP. Every firewall cluster has some concept of a RETH interface, regardless of the vendor. A RETH allows an interface or interfaces to participate in cluster control protocols. In most cases, a logical RETH interface is comprised of physical interfaces on both cluster members. In Junos, a RETH is configured to be a member of a redundancy group. This redundancy group contains all cluster-specific configuration and defines which node is active for assigned RETHs based on that configuration. The active node for a RETH is responsible for passing traffic across member links. So that's the basics. If you can give me just a few more minutes, we need to talk about two concepts that are a bit less common before moving into the meat of this exercise. First, as I mentioned, in most cases, a RETH is comprised of physical interfaces on both cluster members. There are, however, use cases where you may want to configure a RETH with a single member interface. This single interface would naturally only exist on one node with failover from the active node resulting in the RETH being down. Now, I actually used this design in one of my SRX cluster failover video series for my simulated WAN links. You can see that here. I did this to ensure that link failover, and more importantly, the protocols operating over that link, are subject to cluster controls. I discuss this in greater detail in that video series, but the point here is that at any moment, a link that is a member of a RETH on the active cluster node is operating like any normal interface. Second, should an administrator wish to increase bandwidth or improve link resiliency, RETH interfaces also support 802.3AD LACP link aggregation. Now again, I'm taking this out of the context of the SD-WAN. We talked about that as a requirement earlier, but if you're just setting up a cluster normally, LACP is an option. Now this is configured within the RETH it is also discussed in my SRX cluster failover series. And you can see that here on the diagram as well. In fact, to recap, you can see these RETH interfaces here, and then you can see they only have a single member interface, and then we can see this LACP down here. Because even in an active-active cluster, only links on a single node that are associated with the RETH are passing traffic at a given time, the lag configuration is a bit unique. As you can see here in the documentation, while the cluster configuration presents a single LACP enabled RETH to the downstream virtual chassis, the links from each cluster node are, a separate, are associated with a separate aggregated Ethernet interface. We can see AE0 here, and then we can see AE1 here. <clears throat> I think this has something to do with how the administrative key is generated on each cluster member for LACP, but it might just be a function of only one node passing traffic at a time. All right, thanks for sticking with me. We finally arrived at our problem statement. Now, if you recall from the start of this video, when setting up peers with an SD-WAN hub cluster, each peer we define must be given a VLAN ID, and that VLAN ID must be added to RETH4. RETH4 is configured as a trunk and is automatically configured for LACP so that additional interfaces can be patched without additional configuration. In this diagram, we can see that 40 gigabits of total capacity is available using the RETH bundle for DC peering and or core LAN subnets. A few days ago, I was on a call with a customer discussing an SD-WAN POC design. In the data center lab that we are using, we have an SRX 4200 cluster that will be provisioned as an SD-WAN enterprise hub. This hub will peer with two downstream routers to advertise subnets provisioned on our lab spoke site and to receive prefixes from the customer core for internal and internet routing. Due to a topology requirement, we must connect the gateway cluster directly to the downstream peers, and we must do so using the default provisioning workflow that assigns each peer a VLAN ID and adds it to the RETH4 trunk. To highlight this consideration, there is no switch or virtual chassis between the cluster and the routers. 
Our reference architecture here at Juniper has RETH4 connecting to a virtual chassis with member links spread across the VC members for link resiliency. From there, since it's a switch, we separate the VLANs being trunked on RETH4 and plumb them to the routers they need to reach. As I thought about this consideration, I thought about how LACP is configured on a downstream switch connected to a RETH and got to thinking that maybe, in a scenario with only two routers, this type of design might actually be possible. Consider that in a RETH, the links associated with the node that is active for the redundancy group that the RETH is configured for, the only the links are passing traffic in that active node. Also consider that while the RETH ensures a degree of statefulness between the member interfaces on the active node and the standby node, that no state exists on the downstream device these links are connected to, whether that's a, a virtual chassis, a single switch, whatever. So in this scenario, why can't we just patch the links from node zero into one router and the links from node one into the other router? Well, why not indeed? At this point, I did what any self-respecting engineer would do and I built a lab. So let's take a look at that. First, I did a really rough and tumble diagram. And you can see that here. Here in my home lab, I have a clustered SRX340. Now, I'm not testing the SD-WAN component of this. I'm just testing the cluster behavior. So I don't need the same type of hardware that my customer has. I've created a redundant a ref zero. Doesn't need to be ref four. Again, this is just for behavior. And then downstream of that, I've got a couple EX4200 switches that are licensed so that I can run BGP on them. So I've got IBGP running between those two routers and I've got eBGP running from router one here and router two up to this SRX cluster and connected you know, into each node. The, the specific interfaces aren't important here. I then have a VERP group going down to an EX2300 switch and you know, a laptop connected to that. And this is just for testing this VERP stuff down here. On the SRX340 cluster, I've added uh, additional IP addresses to my loopback interface so that I have something interesting to advertise. Uh, it's just a bunch of uh, 192 addresses. You'll see those here as well. So let's first check the cluster state and jump over here. This is my primary cluster, so I can do a show uh, chassis cluster status, and we'll see that I'm healthy. This redundancy group here, uh, redundancy group two, this is where my ref zero is assigned. We can look at that by doing show configuration interfaces ref zero. We can see this is configured for redundancy group two, and I've also enabled LAC P. I have two peers set up on the cluster, one for each of those downstream routers, but at any one time, only one of them is going to be active. And that is because only one of these links, either the one here that's coming out of, I can't highlight here, I guess, um, but the one that's coming down to RTR1 from the cluster or RTR2, only one of these is going to be active at a time. And that, again, has to do with this redundancy group. So if we look at the redundancy group again, we can see that right now for redundancy group two, node one is the primary. So we would expect this peering with RTR2 to be up. And we can check that. So I can jump over to RTR1, which is this EX4224F, and I can show BGP summary, we should only see one connection up, and this is going to be the IBGP peer, this 172. And I can jump over to RTR2, and we should see them both up. Right, we see the one that goes up to the cluster, and we see the one that goes to IBGP. Now, the reason that RTR2 is active right now, and you might have noticed this, uh, this value here, I did a manual failover. So normally the primary would be node zero and I don't have this configured to preempt. And actually that doesn't even matter because when you trigger a failover manually, you have to manually fail it back. It assumes that you've done it for a reason and it assumed correctly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fail this back over and we'll get some tests going first. But what we should expect to see when we fail this back over is we should expect to see RTR one's peer come back online. And we should expect to see this peer go offline. And we can kind of test how quickly this happens by, we'll just do a ping here. Um, I think we could do that actually. Here's our EX2300. I think we can do that ping from here, 10.0. That should not ping. That's That link is down. This should. So that is the peer. And I've got some other protocols running here and some static routes just to make sure this EX2300 can reach, but nothing out of the ordinary. So when we do this failover, this should stop and this should work. So I'm going to start this ping 
as soon as I trigger the failover, and we'll just see how quickly this ping starts responding, and then we can switch back over to the other switch and check to make sure our BGP is up. And actually, let's just do two separate windows to do that. Oh, geez, drag it off the screen. My bad. There we are. And there. Great. So jump over to that. Request chassis cluster failover. This is going to be, we fail the redundancy group over, not the RAT. That was redundancy group two. And we fail it over to node zero. Now, before we do that, I'm going to start this and we'll do just a refresh five. And I'll start my ping over here. Oh, that's right. I have to reset that because I did it manually. Chassis cluster over reset. Redundancy group two. There we go. And now we can trigger that failover. Oh, did it already go? Jeez, it's fast if it did. Probably going right now. Hey, look at that, it already flipped. <laughs> so we can see that already came up. Let's see. Oh, geez, ha, I'm using screen. Can't really uh, do the scroll wheel here. We can see that peer is now up. This peer should be down. Although we might be waiting for a hold down timer to expire. And this is one of the considerations here. We can do things like BFD to make this go a little bit quicker and a little bit cleaner. Um, we should be able to ping 10.0.10.0 from here now. Yeah. So we're just waiting for this to clear. And that link is down now. Did I type this in right? Oh, I can reach you. Oh. Oh, these must have just been somewhere in there. So the failover itself is pretty quick. And I think there's some tuning I can do with this test that would probably yield a little bit more accurate results in terms of you know traffic path and forwarding. And I'm sure there's some tuning I can do under the hood with BGP to make this go a little bit quicker. But the nuts and bolts are that that actually works. Now, the consideration is that this only ever works if you've got two routers because you have to sort of align the routers with the nodes and you're only ever going to have two nodes. So if we had three routers, where would your connection go? You couldn't create a lag bundle that spanned across two devices that were stateless. So this use case works. Now, again, I would always suggest that you drop your uh, refs into a switch or a virtual chassis of some sort or a stack, uh, and then connect your routers to that. Uh, that would be the recommendation. But if this is a scenario that you're dealing with, or you're in a pocket, and this is just how you have to have it set up, this does work. And it works reasonably well. I've played with this a few times over the weekend. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to shoot me an email, drop something in the comments below. Um, it's a fairly straightforward architecture, but I know there's a lot of uh, nuts and bolts that we had to review ahead of time. So I appreciate you for sticking through with that. And as always, have a great day and I'll talk to you again soon. Take care.